Hi, I'm Clark Dennis Cundiff and coming to you remotely this Sunday, October 25th, 2020, um, because I had orthoscopic knee surgery on Friday afternoon, which was originally scheduled for Wednesday. But I thought I still might be able to make it to church today to be with you, uh, but I was overly optimistic. So coming to you via video today, and thanks for Bob Howard and Liz Barnett and all the rest of the team for being flexible to make this change this morning, as I did not have a great night and uh, it was going to be problematic to try to make it to church today. So uh, coming to you with our message today, as we seek to continue to see Jesus with 2020 vision in 2020, as we talk about how Jesus teaches us to share the good news, to share the good news. And you heard the, the scripture earlier, John 4, 4 through 26, and deep breath in, let it out, another deep breath. Dear Lord, we ask your blessings on this time as we look closer at your divinely inspired words, Lord. Open up our hearts, minds, and souls that we may receive that message that we each need this Sunday morning, Lord, to serve you, to be your hands and feet, to thrive during this pandemic. And we do pray for healing, Lord, for all the COVID-19 and all the situations and people have it and other people that are on our prayer request, Lord. We lift those prayers up to you. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And as I'm always continually learning about technology, <laughs> it's amazing. So the scripture today comes from John 4, 4 through 42, and Jesus does something pretty amazing. Not that what Jesus does all the time isn't pretty amazing. He gives us that incredibly perfect example to seek to follow. And today's scripture is no different. As in verse 4 of John 4, he says, Now he had to go through Samaria. Now, Jews and Samaritans were hated enemies. There had been some intermarrying years and years before, and because of that, they'd separated, and a Jewish person would literally walk miles and miles to not step into Samaritan territory. So it's interesting that Jesus chooses, says, he had to go to Samaria. And again, Jesus continues to cross these cultural barriers, continues to be that place of acceptance accepting all of us exactly where we are, that unconditional love that God gives us each and every moment. So he does. He goes through Samaria, and he comes into the middle of town at noon, and he's hot, and the disciples go to find food. And what happens? He runs across a Samaritan woman who's coming at noontime. And normally, we think women would normally come in groups in the morning, but, but she's coming at noon, a hotter time of day, but there's nobody else around. And we find out later what that might signify. So Jesus asked her for a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? The Jews did not share things that come with Samaritans. It was out of norm. Would not, one, have anything to do with a Samaritan, male or female. Two, a Jewish rabbi would not have anything to do with a woman in public, other than his own wife when he's at home. So he's crossing all these cultural barriers to reach out to share the good news to this Samaritan woman. So she calls it as she sees it. Why would, you, why would you talk to me? And Jesus says to her in verse 10 of John 4, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. Now, living water can certainly mean fresh water in the spring. And as I've come back from my backpacking on the Appalachian Trail last week, water is a rare commodity. You carry all your water with you. We carry filters with us to get water so we don't pass up a stop to get water without refilling. And that living water is that fresh, good water. But it also can mean, as Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah uses it, living water was a term that had been used by the prophet Jeremiah to describe the hope available to those who loved by God's standard rather than by the political standards of the world. Living water. You drink of this living water and you will thirst no more. And that's what Jesus says in verse 13 and 14. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. The one from the well, Jacob's well. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. 
The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. That power of the Holy Spirit bursting right. What is it Jeremiah says? I, I try to hold it in and I cannot. It's like a fire burning in my bones and I've got to share it. I've got to release it. I've got to share it with others. And of course she's saying, hey, this is great. Can I have this living water? I won't have to keep coming back to the well and get water. More on a practical side, right? But it's a great question, right? But then Jesus says, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answers, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you were right, saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one with whom you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Jesus knows, right? Jesus knows the number of hairs on our head. Jesus knows our heart, knows all of our secrets, knows her secrets. And calls him to the attention that he does have it. And she says, ah, sir, I see that you are a prophet. But see, he doesn't judge her. He acknowledges that these actions, but doesn't condemn her, accepts her as she is, just as Jesus accepts every single one of us where we are. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't encourage us to grow and to not make those same mistakes again, no. But never judge as a sinner. He ministers to her, accepts her where she is, encourages her to grow in her faith, to drink the living water, the spiritual nourishment. So maybe this was an opportunity that she was thirsting for the spiritual water, that she had had some difficulties in her life, not unlike each of us have from day to day. And she was looking for the spiritual nourishment, the water where she would thirst no more. And maybe she was facing some decisions in her life and trying to figure out how to find a better path. Then she kind of changes the subject, but then Jesus brings it back to, in verses 23 and 24, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now the Samaritans worshipped at one place and the Jews worshipped at Jerusalem and they had two locations of worship, but he says it's not about the location. It's about worshiping in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And then the woman replies, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 34, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to complete His work. So there are more important things in life than food. I know, Lord. I'm working on that. Food is always good, right? But that's of the material. That's the physical nourishment that, yes, God knows we need. It helps provide it for us. But Jesus is more concerned about our spiritual nourishment. Our spiritual nourishment. Jesus makes clear that food that sustains us, sustains him is his vocation. The food that sustains him is his vocation. Because remember, he sent the disciples off to go find food. They come back and he says, oh, I'm not hungry. I have food that you don't know of and really confused the disciples. And his food is doing the will of God the Father, who sent him to earth, fully human, fully divine, to create this perfect example for us to seek to follow, to suffer on the cross for our forgiveness of sins, and to die and be raised from the dead, that we have the gift of eternal life. So it's a good news. We're supposed to share the good news, right? Our prayers, our presence, our financial gifts, our service, and thanks for Bob for preaching last week, and our witness. Jesus teaches us to share the good news, to come alongside people, to develop relationship with people. And if all my friends go to church, then I'm going to have the opportunity to, 
to share with some people who might not know of a God who loves them, who wants a relationship with them. So I need to cultivate friends that don't go to church. We, each of us, need to develop friends that may not go to church. And then we come alongside them and we listen. And we truly listen. And we reflect back. We have conversation. We have communication. We establish trust. We establish relationship. And hopefully and prayerfully they'll see that light, the light of the good news that shines forth from us. And at some point they'll ask, well, how did you get through your orthoscopic knee surgery? Or how did I get through the last two miles of hiking on the Appalachian Trail when I needed orthoscopic knee surgery? I did a lot of praying. And God was faithful. Now maybe I've been silly to do that to begin with, but God did help me through that. And God helps me through this too. So what's the good news? Good news is Jesus came to save all people. Who are our Samaritans today? Who would we think less likely positive about? Who do we shun? Who do we have prejudice against? Is it a prejudice against education? Is it a prejudice against skin color? Is it a prejudice against religious belief? We're a country where all religious beliefs are welcome. But we're called to share the good news of God, to share the divinely inspired words of God in the Bible, God's truth. And yes, we're not supposed to condemn, but we're also still supposed to admit when things appear to be, I'm not the judge, but it appears that this is not what Scripture's asking me to do and maybe not what the Scripture's asking you to do. That we can be that truth and love to hold up that mirror. Not in a judgmental way, but in an uplifting, informative way, right? So Jesus came for all people, those, those I dislike and like. Remember, they say you'll be surprised at who you'll see in heaven when you get there, right? Thank you, Lord. I pray I do. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I profess my faith and guaranteed salvation. I will receive the gift of God today, every day. God is first and foremost in my life. And that's my prayer so much. It's like God is first and foremost. What am I supposed to do if God is first and foremost? And how am I supposed to spend my day? How am I supposed to spend my money, my time, my energy? God is first and foremost. God is my foundation. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And I will receive that living water that continues to nourish us. And brings us even deeper. Sanctifying grace brings us even deeper into that relationship with God. So I will worship God in spirit and truth. It's not about location. Yes, we're supposed to worship together as a group, whether it's online or in person. And yes, we're supposed to worship with ourselves to God too, that personal relationship. And I am nourished by doing the will of God. Now, there's another quick scripture I want to reference that I love when we talk about sharing the good news of God's great love. It comes from Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 14 through 15. It says, But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So we are sent. Our right relationship with God calls us to go and tell, to be the hands and feet. And maybe it's presence. Maybe it's no words at all. Share the gospel and if necessary, use words. Proclaim. We're sent out. Then we have to tell people. Tell of God's good news. And maybe it's doing first. My actions speak louder than my words. Maybe it's being that friend. Being that person that lifts someone up. Being that encourager. Being that person that helps them in a situation that they need help. 
And I want to help them hear as I seek to hear God's message for me each and every day. And choose to believe so that I will be saved. We're sent, we're called to proclaim, we're called to hear, we're called to believe. And through all that, as we proclaim Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we are saved. How beautiful are the feet. And this is, and actually they're quoting that Romans is quoting from Isaiah. How beautiful upon Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. Amen. So I challenge you, go share the good news. Let's share the good news of God's great love to a world, to a people that are thirsting for that spiritual war. God bless. Amen.